<clears throat> Hello, welcome to this Wagner Law webinar focused on executive compensation and stock plan issues that have sprung from the global pandemic into the global and also the local economies we face. During our agenda today, we're going to survey a variety of money issues and material risks that directors and officers of all size companies are facing in the midst of the market disruption and uncertainty that's filled right now with the future economic prospects. Our goal in this hour is rather simple. We aim to initiate thought about actions that make the most sense to consider, as well as to take in some cases, from an individual as well as from a company perspective during the pendency of the pandemic. The thought right now is to look at where we are one month into the pandemic and be ready to take action depending on what unfolds in the near future. Dan, we've been through at least three major downturns in our careers. I'm hoping you can take a minute to explain for our listeners more about your practice general insights drawn from past downturns. Dan? Yeah. Uh, my practice is uh, generally an employee benefit practice. And I've been, as you mentioned, it's been through a number of downturns, including some other crises. Uh, this one is somewhat unusual in that uh, we're not sure whether or not we're dead in the middle of a crisis or at the edge of a crisis or whatever. Certainly we're in a health crisis, but in terms of economics, this year has been rather strange. We started out gangbusters, then we had about three weeks in March where the bottom came, fell out, and then we had some time that now the market has uh, halfway self-corrected. So stay tuned. It should be, a, a, unfortunately, a very bumpy ride, but uh, we'll see whether or not it corrects itself and also whether or not we're geographically focused. If you look at certain areas of the country, at least from what I can Read, uh, they seem to be more or less okay. You look at the Washington, D.C. area, and most of us are uh, very disrupted. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Between the two of us, we I just calculated it. I think we have somewhere between 70 and 80 years of experience to draw from. Um, we work with both public and private oh, companies. I, I say thank you maybe for that, Mark. <laughs> You're right, Dan. And um, we work with a lot of um, 501c3s and other um, not-for-profit entities. So we're gonna draw from that during our dialogue. We'll work through this agenda, just hitting high points, and certainly welcome anyone who's listening who wants more information to contact us by email or calling the Wagner Law Firm for follow-up information. With that background, we wanna start out, and I'll turn it back to Dan, to um, speak about some of the short-term steps that companies can be taking right in the at this moment in the where they face you know stresses from the downturn dan well thank you i mean the first thing that i would suggest to everyone is to take a very close look at your current uh incentive plans uh, it's interesting at least i found interesting over the years that sometimes what i think is true is not true so i would uh, first thing recommend find the document once you found it really Careful, read it carefully, and then try and project out forward. Uh, the, uh, one of the first questions to ask yourself is, what is the year that you're using as a measuring rod? Uh, is it a calendar year? Is it a fiscal year? And it may make quite a difference. If you happen to have a fiscal year that ended March 31, it would look very different than what it might look today. If you're looking at a calendar year, who knows? Uh, so that I think that would be the first step to take a very careful look at. The second step to take a very uh, careful look at is what are the targets in your plan? Uh, as to the extent that you have a plan, uh, what are the fiscal targets that are provided and what are the measuring rods? It's because that will become critical to determine whether or not your current plan works or whether or not you want to uh, change your plan. The other aspect is to figure out what are the uh, markers. Are they regionally based markers? Are they time-based markers? And what is your industry? 
So, for example, if I happen to be a delivery service in New York City, my guess is that, that those delivery services are doing fairly well. There are other industries that are do, still doing fairly well, and maybe not only despite the times, but also because of the times. On the other hand, uh, if you're uh, a real estate agent, you may or may not be doing well. I mean, things may be completely dead. If you're providing services, uh, things may be completely dead. If you have a storefront and your store is closed, that's a really bad thing. The uh, other thing to look at is um, what is your measuring rod? Are you using public stock prices? Are you looking at a valuation aspect? Uh, those may be critical. and may be very critical as to how you come out. The other aspect is uh, what does the future have to hold uh, given what you can see? I mean, we all have broken, I would joke, I mean, I've, uh, pardon me, but there was a joke saying that those people who spend their life looking at crystal balls wind up pulling a lot of glass out of their hands, and I think we're all in, in that boat uh, at the moment. The one other thing to bring to people's attention for the moment right now is um, if you have a qualified plan, the cap on compensation for 2020 is $285,000 a year. Um, and uh, your top hat plan would probably tie in on dollars above that so that you'd need to look at. Or alternatively, are your targets totally independent of your qualified plan? And thereby, you may use you may need a different metric. The one of the things that I want to raise before I turn back over to Mark is typically these programs are driven by uh, a team of people. Uh, since we're lawyers, I'll start with lawyers first. The second would be typically some type of consultant, and the third would be, would be the accountants. Uh, now would be my recommendations. Now would be a very good time to have uh, the client uh, and the three team members be on the phone or meet in person to get a better sense. And as I automatically say meet in person, although most people these days because of health reasons are uh, not particularly uh, interested in having personal meetings as compared to having phone meetings because of the fears of the coronavirus. Anyway, let me turn it back to you, Mark. Yeah, well, when you mentioned teams, Dan, um, I felt that that's a good way to end the first topic because in most companies, the motivation from retention to incentives at the executive level are critical to a company's success. And so as a result, I think on an, an individualized basis, company by company, they need to be assessing, you know, are the current incentives going to keep the right people in place? There's a second piece of it that's already come up in my practice, which involves a fairly um, a national company that took one quick step, you know, you, you react quickly in the face of what's going on these days, and they instituted an across-the-board pay decrease. I had a call from a couple executives of the company who basically said that they had employment agreements that did not allow for pay reduction, and did that suddenly free them from non-competition provisions as well as create a material breach that created severance rights. So I think companies need to be thoughtful about what they do and also be considering what's the effect on the executive team and how do they make sure that they you know, retain and motivate that group. Um, as we start to go through like a bit of a laundry list of things companies could consider, you know, one of them that comes to mind from my perspective involves um, terminations of non-qualified plans. Not really foremost in companies' minds necessarily, but at this time when there's such a downturn, I think it may accentuates the sense of individual risk that goes with non-qualified plans. You know, if the employer goes bankrupt, they lose their value. On the other hand, there are two instances when a company can terminate non-qualified plans and pay out. And a termination could actually be something that's done not only to kind of reduce anxiety from the individual executive perspective over future employer solvency, but also retain the person. And how would they do that? Well, under the 409A rules, one type of termination occurs in the context of a change control when you can do an immediate payout. But there's an ordinary course 
determination that's allowed, you know, where they're not, where the company's not in immediate danger of insolvency or facing, you know, a company hardship. And in that case, ordinary course termination of a plan, you pay out within 12 to 24 months. That could actually be a retention period that a company institutes in connection with paying out non-qualified plan benefits. So if a company is kind of in the midst of a downturn but not facing bankruptcy, it may very well want to consider freeing up non-qualified money as a way to both encourage executives to remain employed through the payout period 12 to 24 months later, as well as to reduce their anxiety about long-term risk from the company. I'll mention the second piece that um, goes with the next one, which is cancellation of, of equity awards or diversification, which kind of comes from 409A in that while 409A creates many impediments to changes, you know, very strict rules in general, one of the places where 409A gives some flexibility involves investment return. Company, you can make individual choices that change an investment measure for non-qualified deferred comp and make it effective on a prospective basis. As long as you're not changing the payout time for an award, for example, for restricted stock that would have, you know, or performance awards that would vest in the future, a company could allow individuals to diversify out of employer stock by coming up with alternatives that allow the individual to have the same payout and same vesting terms, but to switch from employer stock to some other measure of return. And in that way, where executives feel overexposed to a company, they can diversify. Um, last year, I wrote an article on this. I'll be glad to send it to anyone who is interested. With that, I'll turn it back to Dan for the fourth item, which involves um, taking a moment now to look at employment agreements and consider changes. Um, as I started out this uh, slide, I was talking about pulling out your document and taking a really careful look at it. I'm always amazed uh, how things may vary between what I think reality is versus what reality actually is. So the first thing I would very strongly suggest is uh, pull out your employment agreement, read it, and it depends with you're the executive or whether you're the uh, acting in the role of the uh, CEO or top uh, controlling officer would be to one of you, the executive doesn't say what you expect it to say, and two, if you're the company, he doesn't say what you ex expect it to say. Um, that would be the first place to start. Once I get past that and assuming that things are more or less okay, uh, the next question is what can we do to try and protect the expectation of the officers to be able to actually receive their money uh, if the various items happen and that they don't also wind up exceeding the 280G limits or other uh, various items? Uh, so that's, uh, that may wake people up. I mean, I'm always, as I think I mentioned more than once in this presentation, I'm always amazed at the difference between what I think reality is versus what reality actually is. Uh, the second aspect would be to take a very careful look at the change in control uh, protections. Uh, it is more likely during a difficult period of time that there may be a change of control, an unexpected change of control, than there would be in terms of the ordinary times. Uh, many companies, uh, at least in the days of the startups, uh, the key element was, or the key target was, uh, develop into a workable entity and then sell it, and then where you really get your payoff is on the, the sale. I mean, particularly during the times prior to the 2007-2008 uh, debacle, uh, one of the things that we would very often look at is, not so much of the current pay, but the payout when a company change hands. So that that would be a, a second aspect. And also uh, would be to wind up taking a careful look at the change in control protections so that the employees or the key employees would have some control over whether or not their company changes hands and if it changes hands that they're properly compensated for it. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I'd be glad to pick up with the last Any item. Any additional on thoughts this. on that one? No, but go, I, I thought you said it well. Dan. Go ahead. Going to, the fifth, going to the fifth item here, indemnification and director and officer insurance. <clears throat> In my experience, when you have um, small, especially relevant for small and mid-sized companies, 
there's often an underappreciation of the personal liability risk that directors and officers face for these companies. In many cases, I think it takes a downturn for individuals to start to worry about um, not, worry about their risk as well as to kind of appreciate what's in place to protect them. I'm reminded when I think of that of a client of mine back in the 2007 recession that had hundreds of employees but very quickly descended um, from that size of hundreds of employees down to about 20 people who were trying to keep the company alive in Chapter 11. One thing that happened through that downturn involved the, um, you know, the elimination of executive level employees to the point where they reached, um, with respect to their 401k plan, having no trustees who were current employees. So they had individuals who were fired who were nevertheless still stuck with being trustees of not only a 401k plan, but also a defined benefit plan as to which the PBGC was bringing actions to collect um, overdue amounts. PBGC went against those ind people ind individually as trustees and started raising questions about how well they had performed their duties, even in the midst of a company that had gone from hundreds of employees down to 20. I mention that because going into the downturn, those individuals had an indemnification right from the company for losses and expenses that they might incur filling plan duties, whether you're a fiduciary of the plan or just an executive responsible for it. But those indemnification rights become worthless when a company goes bankrupt because at that point, the individual starts to become just a general creditor for pre-bankruptcy claims for indemnification. Where I'm going with that is director and officer insurance. Companies ought to take a very careful look to basically keep their directors and officers safe to make sure that they've got adequate coverages in place and often they need a special rider for their ERISA plans to protect directors and officers. So again, if a company doesn't have that now or people don't feel confident that they are protected, that's worth a look. Now we'll go. And just as, a, an, uh, just as an aside, I was involved with sending some of those folks that got caught in the switches in that recession. And I, I remember one particular plan that we uh, had, were representing some of the players. There were eight or ten players involved, and there were eight or ten uh, law firm teams. So, um, what you, if the bottom falls out, uh, you also wind up with a situation where you have to make sure that everybody's properly represented, and that if there are conflicts, the conflicts are handled properly. Yeah. Well said. Mark, go ahead. Um, yeah, going to Rabbi Trust. They may seem odd to consider in a downturn because, you know, the general sense is that rabbi trusts are a vehicle that provides security against uncertainty, but then does not have value in the case of an employer's bankruptcy. Well, it's, and both of those are certainly the case, but in the lion's share of companies that don't go bankrupt, a rabbi trust can be very valuable because it does give protection to the individual and a sense of some security in the face of uncertain times relating to either severance or deferred compensation. With that in mind, I think the easiest way to understand a rabbi trust is to go back to the 1980s when the first trust arose. And literally it came from a private letter ruling sought by a synagogue. And the synagogue had an old rabbi that they wanted to pay um, to cover through a pension plan or a pension benefit, which the synagogue wanted to pay monthly. They wanted to put money in the bank to pay the rabbi the pension. The private letter ruling that the synagogue received said basically that as long as the money in the trust was subject to the synagogue's creditor claims, the rabbi would not be taxable on that money until actual payments received. And that was really the birth of the rabbi trust. It was followed about 10 years later by um, IRS, um, a revenue ruling and a revenue procedure that put together not only a model rabbi trust, which is a very straightforward instrument to put together, but also tax rules that needed to, um, the companies needed to follow to make sure that they could put together a rabbi trust that involved funding the trust early 
and having the individual be taxed as they collected benefits later. Um, in my experience in a downturn, this can be a valuable um, trust to put together for executives because while there, there will be bankruptcy risk, there's a lot of uncertainty that comes up with a downturn in terms of job security, what the future of a company will hold, what's going to happen to deferred compensation, SERP benefits. All of those can be covered through a rabbi trust with an independent trustee that can be instituted at a low cost in general. Um, there's something, believe it or not, uh, imagine um, or create the image of a springing rabbi. But a springing rabbi trust is one that might not be funded until an event occurs. So, for example, in mergers and acquisitions, it commonly comes up, or not commonly, but I think it's a useful technique, to actually have a rabbi trust spring into place on a sale where the money that would pay executive severance goes into a trust. Why is that significant? Because often the most frequent cases where severance gets contested is after a change control. So if you believe in the golden rule of business, which is he who has the gold rules, it's often better to have the money in a rabbi trust, have the rabbi trust pay out to the um, individual executive when severance occurs, and then if the buying company after a deal contests it, the buying company needs to go after the executive. So a rabbi trust that springs in a transaction can be very valuable. Um, you'll see at the bottom of this page, there's a number of things to consider, whether you want an independent trustee, such as a bank, or can find someone that's lower priced, but trustworthy in terms of independence and suitable. You can have one rabbi trust for a group of executives or individual rabbi trust. Employer, there can be um, essentially individually directed investment um, through the way um, a rabbi trust is put together. And then we're gonna go back later to solvency and credit risk, but that's the point where rabbi trusts have their limits. Um, they cannot protect against bankruptcy. Short of bankruptcy, they can have some value. Dan, would you like to add anything on that? Yeah, I do, not necessarily on the last point, but I do wanna spend a few moments talking about the independent trustee and also the degree of protection uh, you know, I often analogize that the uh, trust rabbi trustee needs to be the equivalent of a junkyard dog and a contested uh, purchase or sale or takeover uh, in that uh, at that point, I mean, many instances, rabbi trusts have all friendly parties, and that works quite well if it's, just, if it's a way just to marshal the assets for a regular retirement. But if indeed you have a hostile takeover, uh, then what you want is the trustee to be really independent and someone also to have the backbone to stand up, whether in court or otherwise, to protect the individuals. Uh, one of the things that that triggers or, or mandates is that the rabbi trusts have two pots of money, one of which is real funding or funding that one would expect to be necessary if there was a hostile takeover, and the second would be a war chest to act to pay for legal fees. Because uh, there can be situations where uh, the rabbi trust is not just a protective wrapper, but it actually is there to defend the interests of the executives, in which case uh, you do want someone who both has the ability and the backbone to defend you and also has the money available uh, as a pot to uh, pay for legal fees. So I mean, that's, uh, and we've had situations in the past where they, we really had to exercise those and um, uh, they actually worked. But uh, yes. the common rabbi trustee, as you mentioned, is one just to segregate the assets so that somebody decides to commingle assets can't, but there are situations where they really are real, real they have to be set up as real hardcore um, entities. Uh, go ahead, Mark. Am I next? Yeah, you made a great. I think I'm the next one. Um, yes, you do. Go ahead. One of the, I'm sorry, let me just switch uh, the phone. Uh, the next one is adjusting goals for formula based incentive plans and awards. And we look at pay for performance uh, adjustments in response to downturn volatile results and better customization. Uh, one of the things that one really needs to look at is to 
uh, take a look at what the downturn is and what industries are. So take it, for example, today uh, we have uh, fancy sit-down restaurants are fairly empty. Home delivery services are doing relatively well in this downturn. Uh, and also uh, preservation uh, of uh, the assets versus aggressive growth. Uh, one, the arbiter that we have involved has to have both the appearance of fairness and actual fairness. And uh, we need to look at company-based uh, triggers, geopolitical events. Uh, so for example, uh, and I'm not sure what it quite means, but today's headlines are that oil prices are negative. I'm not sure whether it really means that uh, uh, oil companies are paying people to take their oil, but uh, it may very well mean that. So that uh, we are looking at uh, taking a very careful look at adjusting the goals for formula-based incentive plans and awards based on uh, today's situation. And, uh, and it can vary also. I mean, one of the things that I wonder, and I think I may have mentioned it a little bit earlier, but right now uh, we're uh, on the upside of a downturn. Uh, are we going to wind up in good times by the end of the year, worse times by the end of the year? And certainly we're, uh, they depend upon the industry that you're in. So that one would have to look at uh, adjustments in response to downturn and volatile results for better customization. So if you're looking at uh, setting uh, goals for formula-based incentive plans and awards, you really want to look at and periodically adjust whether or not they make sense. So that if uh, you want to wind up incenting people to take a company that's in bad shape and get it to even keel, that may be one set of awards. The awards may not be based upon absolute dollars. They may be based on relative awards. On the other hand, if you're looking at a very good company that you want to incent to make greater profits, uh, what you're looking at is to have people uh, be subject to whether it be absolute rates of return for, the, for what the company is providing or relative rates. So, for example, if a company is earning X and you want to send people to get it to three times X, uh, X wouldn't be worthy of a bonus in the program. And uh, three times or higher X may be uh, worthy of uh, a better uh, rate of return than what would otherwise be there. Uh, so it, it really ties into this whole question of better customization so that it's not just apps, it's just not boilerplate, but it really takes a look at the company tries to figure out what you're trying to incent and then meets it. I found in the past that's amazing how programs uh, manage to incent people doing what the program asks. So if the program is asking uh, a certain type of performance that is not what you really want, you may find that you your plan works perfectly, but it works in the wrong way. The last piece is, is uh, discretion on making adjustments as a result of extraordinary events. So that, uh, again, if we're tying back to a theme that we've been talking about, if we look at where we might have been uh, as recently as six months ago, uh, today may not be, we may not be in the same place today. Uh, today, the key may be much more preservation of assets, preservation of uh, the company, rather than pushing people, rather than pushing people to provide for higher rates of return so that um, uh, it does require a tremendous amount of um, customization. Uh, Mark, do you want to go ahead? I will, yeah. Um, yeah regarding the discretion um, that Dan just mentioned, this bottom bullet point, I've spent my career in the weeds of legal documents and plans. And one issue that we've already come up with is what happens if a plan allows the setting of performance goals but neither the plan nor the awards you know, reserve expressly discretion to change them once they're in place. Um, that is a tricky issue for two reasons. Um, one is um, it doesn't require participant consent to lower a goal on the premises inherently favorable to an individual. But if a company seeks to change the measure, suppose it's a return on equity measure of um, vesting or um, amount that's payable, and a company wants to change it to a net income or some other standards, 
that would require participant consent, you would presume, based on a plan and depending on its terms. That leads to the second issue, which is you have to dig into plans and awards to look at whether, even if there isn't express um, discretion reserved to make changes, is the administrative um, provision of the plan broad enough to allow it? These types of questions are generally reviewed under a business judgment rule analysis. So on the one hand, if there's a reasonable basis to justify the action, that should be fine. But if there's no plan justification, we start to get into whether a board needs to actually amend a plan and maybe go to stockholders to assure that if it changes goals midstream, that that works for them. So with that, let's go to the next frame. Apologies, which is so oh, Mark, let me just uh, let me just take a moment to add one other one other piece, if I may. One of the things that uh, we've seen with plans uh, that have built in uh, either setting autom automatically setting annual targets or annual reviewing the targets so that they're not on automatic uh, pilot so that uh, if we see a situation as we're in now, where all of a sudden things seem to be very uh, favorable and now the world is coming to an end, it gives you an automatic opportunity to review the uh, targets rather than having to stop everything and do something that's brand new, uh, new in terms of auto in terms of getting into reviewing the targets. I'm sorry, Mark, go ahead, my apologies. Oh, that's well, no, well said, Dan. Um, we thought we'd switch now to underwater stock options. And those of us who work with stock plans are able right now to draw from the early 2000s when the bubble burst and also from the 2007-8 recession to look at you know, essentially what was a playbook of choices that companies follow when stock options have an exercise price that's far above current fair market value. In those cases, we call those options either underwater or out of the money. You know, some of our listeners may reasonably wonder, is it too soon to even talk about a repricing? Earlier, Dan mentioned the team that needs to come together in many cases to, to consider extraordinary executive compensation actions. And this is clearly an instance where you need a team and you need a deliberate approach. Um, a, rep a repricing or a replacement of options is not something that's normally done overnight. It normally takes weeks, if not months, to unfold. So if a company's stock price has been <clears throat> dramatically reduced through this downturn, and it doesn't seem likely that there will be a V-shaped recovery within the next month or two, that company probably should start thinking at least of whether they want to look at their stock options and consider some type of a replacement action. For purposes of today, I'm just gonna very quickly name the top four choices that companies normally pursue. One is basically a buyout of the underwater stock options, and that's just a cash sale. A company can offer different prices for different stock options. Essentially, the further underwater a stock option is, meaning the, um, the exercise price being high compared to what the current market value is, the higher that price is and the more out of the money that option is, the less value it has and the less cash is usually paid. So companies can come up with tranches or variant schedules to address how much they would pay. They're always trying to just figure out what's a fair offer to make that gets individuals to basically agree to surrender their options in exchange for cash. Now, that can only be a choice that makes any sense for a company that sits on cash, and in a downturn, that's not always the case. So equity exchanges are much more prevalent. So one choice would be to exchange options for new options. They could have, you could exchange an option that's underwater for more shares at a lower price, or less shares, or shares with a different vesting schedule. All that can be customized in a transaction. You can also exchange options for something like restricted stock or RSUs. And the last choice that comes up, the fourth one, is a straight repricing. The company just unilaterally reduces the exercise price. For all four of those choices, public companies almost always need to seek stockholder approval. Um, under their plan documents, and that's because of ISS and stock exchange listing requirements, or, or ISS 
and Glass Lewis are the proxy advisory firms that almost always insist on those provisions. And then stock exchange listing requirements need to be followed for things like repricing and other plan provisions and stockholder approval. Now against that background, um, there's another factor to consider, which is if you offer somebody a choice to surrender their out of the money stock option, that often requires what's called a tender offer filing, either um, under federal securities laws through filing a form TO with the SEC or under state blue sky laws. That's an expensive proposition because you have to basically not only go to the regulator and get a sign off or a no action response to your filing, but you also have to take the time to explain in detail and disclose all the material factors relevant to that exchange. What that leads to, in my experience, between the cost of securities compliance and the tender offer filing, as well as the need for some type of a stockholder approval or special meeting, is something to consider in the form of what's easier and less expensive. And that's what I would call an add-on grant. One thing companies can do is if they have underwater stock options is they can just make a new special grant in view of the extreme circumstances we face now. If they have enough shares in their existing plan, they can make the grant and it can be stock options, it could be restricted stock or RSUs. And if their plan doesn't have enough shares, they can come up with a special grant that's contingent on shareholder approval next year. So it's something that companies can look at in extreme circumstances as essentially being a smart, low-cost alternative to the more complex exchange programs that are very often the ones you hear the most about. Dan, would you like to add anything about that topic? Yeah, one of the things that I, I do want to pick up on underwater stock options is look at some history, look at the today, and uh, emphasize a point that you made is you need to be facile. I don't know how many of you remember the SARS uh, scare we had uh, about 20 years ago, but I was out of the country coming back to the U.S. and, and um, unexpectedly wound up in the Toronto airport early in the morning. And every other step, there was a big sign warning people about the dangers of SARS, which was sort of almost uh, nominal in the country I was in and also nominal in the U.S., but in Canada, uh, they were very, very concerned about SARS. So it's amazing how things can both be geographically based and changed automatic uh, very quickly. Uh, where we're at today is I think it's the first time in my lifetime that we've had a pandemic of this degree. I think we've had over a million cases of uh, the coronavirus worldwide. We've had, I don't know how many, uh, tens of thousands of deaths uh, worldwide. But uh, things can change very, very quickly uh, in terms of uh, where you thought you were. And I, I think at some point that we've both talked about a little bit throughout this presentation is that you need to both be uh, vigilant as to what's happening and also try and anticipate sort of the worst possible event. And if, if possible, build into your agreement uh, a compensation for it or an accommodation of it, which I wouldn't necessarily have said before uh, the current uh, coronavirus uh, event. So I did want to add that one piece, Mark. Yeah, well, it does fill in the gap on this frame anybody? because it fills in the gap on this frame, Dan, because, you know, I think when we talk about stock options, they have their greatest value in an up market. But in a down market, such as a downdraft that comes from this pandemic, you know, stock options have a cliff to them that they're really just, you know, a, a, an incentive that isn't working because they're underwater and individuals look at it and have to wait for a rebound and hope that one occurs to have any value. So to me, one reminder of an underwater option is that RSUs and restricted stocks, which have a value tied to the actual value of a share, which may go down, but they're going to have value even in a down market. So with that, let's, whoops, I'm not right. doing a very good job of switching, but let's go to severance and retention, the next frame, because as we, okay. talked in the, as we talked through this call, 
about the issues we face in a downturn. One of them, you know, is continuing theme is executive insecurity, executive retention. And I'll draw a lesson from the merger and acquisition world where in my experience, if a company is a target, executives who are protected in a change control through some type of an agreement will almost always stay through a closing date because they have protection, they have severance, they have some rights. On the other hand, those who are left without any protection and worried and uncertain about what's going to happen to them if their job is eliminated, they almost always are looking for another position to protect themselves. And in that instance, when you look at the range of people who are not protected at the executive level, it's the best performers who normally have alternatives and leave. So there is like an adverse selection that companies face when there are uncertain times, whether it's from a merger or a sale. The one suggestion I have for companies that don't have any type of policy now or an informal one is to think about putting together a formal plan that can be triggered by a RIF or some other event like a change of control or just an ordinary course severance, but a company that can articulate what's gonna be paid to these executives, identify a class of people who are protected. This can go beyond executive level, of course. It could go to all employees. And often you'll have very different severance formulas for the different levels. But whether you have a broad group or a small group, putting together a plan to retain your key people in uncertain times makes a lot of sense. Now, in the plan world, they mm. fall in two categories. Plans that are subject to ERISA and plans that are subject to state contract law. From an employer perspective, far and away the smartest move is almost always to put the plan within ERISA. You would think that a statute that had its origins in the 1970s to protect employees would be one that gives them better litigation protection. But the reality in the severance world is that if you have a plan that's not subject to ERISA, what happens? Well, individuals can sue for um, their expected benefits based on past practices of the company that might not have been written, but they can say, well, someone else that was similarly situated had a certain amount and I should have got the same amount. They can also bring court remedies in state court for things like emotional distress and other damages, so they're not limited to just seeking a plan benefit. They can also have a trial before a state local jury rather than before a federal judge. So if you're subject to ERISA, what do you have? If you do an ERISA severance plan, you have a plan document that can specify a claims procedure. I'll talk about some of the litigation precautions just quickly in that context that companies can have in a plan. But then you can you have um, to have the individual exhaust remedies before bringing a claim. If they do go to court, there's arbitrary and capricious review for those decisions if a plan is well drafted, which it almost always is, meaning high court deference. And you have a judge who knows federal law and ERISA making decisions r rather than a state court jury. And finally, you have limited remedy. The only remedy, there are two remedies really, recovery of the plan benefits and attorney's fees if someone sues under ERISA and is successful. Overall, the, in that balance, it makes a lot of sense for a plan to fall within ERISA and be designed that way. I'll mention briefly, um, what are some of these litigation protections? You know, certainly claims processes are in an ERISA plan, severance plan. You can have arbitration, exhaustion of remedies. You can designate a forum where um, litigation needs to occur. Two of the most underappreciated protections <coughs> that I suggest every plan consider, from stock plans to qualified plans to severance plans, involve statutes of limitation. You can have an internal period that says you can only pursue a claim if you raise it within some period, such as three months or six months following when the first occurrence of the claim occurred. That way, you force individuals who have a claim to alert you promptly. You know what's out there is a risk. You can also shorten the federal court or state court period of limitations. 
there are states that have 21-year contract statute of limitations, which means someone in theory could assert a severance claim 21 years after being fired. You can shorten that to one year, two years, but some period that a court would consider reasonable, but it doesn't have to be the default statute of limitations that would otherwise apply under a, vari a variety of state laws. You can just designate and say, any claim under this plan that goes to court needs to be raised within one or two years after it first arises. Those are all, to me, provisions that plans should be, that have, even in the ordinary course, but now is a good time to put them in. Why? Because in down economies, employees um, tend to sue for benefits and look for arguments more deeply, and certainly the stakes are highest at the executive level. So when I have that middle frame, aristification, that's a long way of saying all the things that that um, encompasses. The last item on this frame is titled retention alternatives. And that's again because companies don't need to be long viewed in terms of how they put together reasons why executives and key employees should be inspired and incentives to stay with their company. There can be short-term arrangements put in place to get through a difficult time. There can be pay to, pay to stay for short periods, event-based vesting. You only get this if we sell the company within a year or two years or something else happens. Some major hurdle gets accomplished that you want, you put a special incentive in place. It keeps people in their seat working in a time of anxiety. And the last thing here is a company that wants to put more on the table can look at its cash reserves and figure out, certainly cash is king for most people, but you can also put equity on the table. I have a solar energy company that is very bullish on its future. Might be a bad time for energy and oil, but for solar, these people feel they're in the right market at the right time. They want equity. And in that case, putting those equity incentives in place at this moment is exactly what they want to be doing. So before we move forward, I'll welcome Dan to add his thoughts. Now, I think um, uh, you, you've been very thorough on this particular section. I mean, the one piece that uh, I might be able to add is on retention alternatives is that um, one really needs to look at it with what is the behavior that you're trying to incent. Uh, one of the things that I've seen both from practice and also from reading on these matters is that more often than not, the incentives that you create incent the behavior that you get. So one really needs to spend a fair amount of time in putting together the incentives or even providing for periodic review of the incentives uh, to make sure that they are aligned with what the what is best for the company, both in terms of survival, if we're currently where we're worried about survival, or in terms of flourishing. Uh, so anyway, uh, I did want to pick that up, uh, Mark. Yeah, and Dan, uh, I just wrote bear with me forward. a second. Uh, yep. The next frame is cash flow disruption, and I welcome you to continue the dialogue by addressing this um, item. Okay. Uh, the big issue that I think we're coming up with today is this whole question of cash flow disruptions. That if you're the if you're a thriving restaurant, and all of a sudden you either have to shut down or you're uh, dealing with takeout, which may not be anywhere near as profitable as uh, being a fancy sit-down restaurant, you really need to look at how do you deal with those cash flow disruptions. One of the things uh, that's happened is actually we've had government intervention. Uh, the government has come in and forgetting about some of the headlines about uh, the incentives being uh, skewed in the wrong direction, but the government's come in and tried to pick up the slack on employee payroll so that the employees are held whole, that they don't necessarily need to worry about uh, paying their uh, rent and, and buying food so to carry them over. Uh, so that you have, we have those particular issues that are coming up that are outside of the company. Uh, the other aspect would be that the company winds up uh, paying people. I mean, we've, we've certainly read in the newspapers, because I've read in the newspapers, of situations where companies have said, okay, uh, we're going to cover people's payroll for a certain period of time. And as long as uh, 
things self-correct within that period, that's great. And if you look at other companies where companies have laid off, I think, tens of thousands of employees, I don't think I've seen hundreds of thousands, but companies have literally laid off tens of thousands of people with almost no notice. Uh, that's not a good situation, although it may be an unavoidable situation. So the amount of dollars we're looking at versus the reserves the company have are, are mind-boggling. Uh, so I mean, that's a, a different side of it to take a look at. Uh, the other piece is, uh, is, are you willing to give up equity? And can you give up equity? Can you provide to employees, hey, cash is short today, but if we get to the other side of this, I will give you a certain piece of the company to own. And in certain instances, if you're looking at small companies, you may have it being a situation where the principals are giving up part of their own personal ownership of the company in order to try and keep the company surviving. On the other hand, if you're looking at a publicly held company or a company with very diverse uh, interests, you're looking at dilution of the shares of the current folks, current people wind up uh, having their interest in the company diluted as a result of uh, passing equity ownership to others. Uh, and one of the things that one needs to look at is, is an equity distribution an incentive or a disincentive? If things are staying uh, basically the same or going up, even though the cash flow may not be good, it would be an incentive. To the extent that all of a sudden the interest tanks, uh, it may wind up being a disincentive. So that's just something that one needs to take a careful look at as well. Uh, you also need to take a look at it, 409A and 457F considerations. Uh, both provisions can wind up having unexpected taxation occur if they're not handled properly. So that you need to be careful under both 409 Cap A and 457F uh, that uh, vesting of those shares don't happen inadvertently. Uh, and um, the, particularly the 409A has an old set of, I think 2005, the most recent set of regs, uh, our still proposed regs, when it came out in 2016, uh, I would suggest taking a very careful look at them uh, if they're applicable to you. And under 457F, uh, 457F, uh, there's been a lot of efforts to put together final regs. So to my knowledge, we still don't have final regs. We have some final, uh, some t temporary regs, uh, but we still don't have final regs. But uh, if you're a tax exempt entity, uh, you'd be looking at 457F. Uh, if you're a taxable entity, I'm sorry, you may also be looking at 409 Cap A as well, because uh, both those provisions may wind up uh, having control over your situation at the same time. Mark, any other thoughts on that one? No, I think that covered it well, Dan. I think it's um, a good opportunity here to switch to clawbacks and covenants. And, you know, for much of this call, we've talked about retaining and motivating executives and key employees, which I think is entirely right. Um, <clears throat> But they, I think there's a flip side to it, which is that, you know, when you go through a downturn like this, you want to look at this difficult period and have a company come out stronger and better. And one part of that, from my perspective, is to look at, okay, you know, what do we have in place now and how can it be improved? And clawbacks are one vehicle and you read about them quite often. I don't actually think they're as good a vehicle as what I'll call holdback, but we'll talk about a couple of these things on this frame. So the traditional meaning of a clawback is that you've actually paid someone money, like a cash bonus. But in some ways, the company, the employer has a contractual right to recover the money. Um, under um, Dodd-Frank Act and under Sarbanes-Oxley, they have what are financial um, clawbacks, which are apl applied to um, public companies, such as if an executive is guilty of um, fraud or misconduct that results in a financial restatement, a classic statutory clawback would say you can, the company can recover the money. Or if fraud or misconduct, or if an executive, I should say, receives um, more performance-based pay based on incorrect results than they should, the company can claw that back under a statutory approach. On the other hand, con contract 
plans, awards, employment agreements, they can also reserve clawback rights so that if somebody, for example, um, has restricted stock that vests or stock options that are exercised and then quits and immediately joins a competitor or breaches trade secret obligations, in those instances, a company can claw back the proceeds of those events. I would contrast that on the second bullet to a holdback. Essentially, that has to establish an approach that doesn't pay the money out now, but it credits it as deferred compensation that's paid out at a later date after the person has honored covenant. Again, going back to the theory that who, those who have the gold rule, it's better to hold the money back than to try to recover it through a clawback mechanism if you're the employer. It's a rare case, frankly, where a company actually sues under a clawback provision. Um, there is a threat that can discourage people from taking bad, to make, taking bad actions, but certainly if a company is holding money, taking a, a person who has a million dollars or 100,000 in deferred compensation, and they only get it if they leave the company and honor their non-compete for one year. That person has either a million dollars or $100,000 worth of incentive to honor that non-compete obligation. So a hold back of the money can be a, an extremely smart approach to put into a practice. One way I've instituted it in many instances would be to take an incentive plan and instead of paying everything out in the form of a large bonus, increase the amount that's paid, but only pay part of it currently and credit the rest to an accumulating deferred comp account that gets paid out after termination of employment. Um, so that's again a hold back by that. If I can, sure, Dan. I'm sorry. If I can interject just a couple of thoughts at this point. I mean, one of the what do the uh, dichotomy between clawback and holdback really reflects on a couple of things. One is the company philosophy. The other is uh, the uh, vote of bargaining power. But I would argue that. If a company has the ability to hold back rather than call back, and maybe pick up something that you picked up, that you always want to be as a company in a uh, hold back. And if you're an employee, you always want to be in a call back. And just emphasizing the point you made is he who has the gold rules. So that's really sort of a very basic uh, premise that I would look at in any contract negotiation. Yeah, thanks, Dan. The, the last thing I'll mention in this frame, you see velvet glove and iron fist. What does that mean? Well, when it comes to m taking these types of principles, whether it's to um, apply a clawback or a holdback to enforcement of a non-compete or a non-solicitor or a trade secret, when you look at the penalty to somebody for violating it, the velvet glove approach would say, well, if you violate the covenant, then we can claw back some item of future compensation, like this year's stock option award or the proceeds of this year's bonus. Uh, an iron fist approach, which some companies have implemented, would say, well, we not only can claw back or hold back, you know, or claw back especially this year's stock option, but we can look at the, any stock options granted within a look back period of two, three, four, five years. And that way there's more at stake immediately. Why can that make sense? Because what you're trying to do in the one hand is reward loyal employees who make the company successful and stay with the company. And on the other hand, discourage disloyalty in the sense of violations of trade secret or non-competition or non-solicitation agreements. Overall, you know, this type of an approach has to be customized to a company's needs. But my thought in raising it here is that if a company is looking to figure out how to improve its system, they can certainly improve it by putting in new and improved incentives, but they can also improve it by considering how do they protect themselves against a the bad actor who you know, um, leaves the company or takes other action against the employer's interest. Now with the, the remaining time, which isn't much, I'm gonna turn it to Dan to talk about this last frame about specific actions relating to employer distress or bankruptcy. Sure, 
Um, if I look at the three particular points, one of which is uh, customized retention and event incentives, uh, and I would think, I mean, not that I would think, but uh, that really uh, winds up uh, forcing the uh, board, and I'm assuming we're board level employees, but forcing the board and also forcing the employee to have a better sense of what they're looking for from each other. Uh, because rather than just having uh, boilerplate language, uh, you're really looking at trying to uh, either incent or disincent particular behaviors. And I think I've mentioned more than once in this presentation that one of the big surprises to people is that whatever their incentives actually do incent behavior. And if you incent the wrong behavior, that's not a good thing. Uh, the second aspect is the 409A rules with regard to unvested and vested compensation uh, that uh, one really needs to look at those rules. And they really, for the most part, would apply more to the uh, vested compensation, I think, than, than the unvested compensation. But it's also, uh, as an alternative to that, it's a function of the seller putting in, uh, I'm sorry, but well, let me just pass on. I'm really, one, my notes are a little bit fuzzy, but the next is rolling forward uh, with regard to restrictive covenants. And uh, the seller would wind up in a sale, should, would wind up putting in stronger or want stronger covenants. The employee would want to have less strict covenants. And um, one of the other aspects would be to have non-competes and also non-solicitation, uh, because one of the key elements, particularly if you have a distressed sale, is that you want to be able to preserve as much of the current management uh, group that you want to preserve and not have people abandoning ships, so that you do want to try and make sure that not only are there uh, restricted covenants, but that also the employees are strongly uh, disincented to compete and also uh, disincented to solicit current employees. Uh, the last piece is uh, what is uh, in terms of the, uh, the I'm sorry, impact on the buyer's incentive plans, and that can be uh, really a, uh, a negotiated matter. I mean, effectively, one would need to take a look at in, in putting these things together, one would need to take a look at as to uh, what uh, what do you want, what kind of behavior do you want to incent? I think I mentioned that more than once, uh, but uh, you, know, you do want to make sure that you incent the proper behavior and that also you may wind up uh, having these as negotiated items so that in effect, if you do wind up in a distressed situation, uh, you would wind up having uh, negotiating the um, proper result under the incentive plan so that people would wind up um, receiving uh, either the proper reward or also the proper incentive to go forward. Uh, I think one of the areas that uh, over the years I've done a fair amount of work in is trying to preserve on behalf of the buyer the core management group just because of, of you may have a company uh, who is currently not doing well, it may be forces outside of the, of the individual. So for example, uh, today, if you want to buy or sell a restaurant, um, the fact that the restaurant doesn't have any customers at the moment may have absolutely nothing to do with you. It may just be that people don't want to go out. So that those are aspects that you may want to negotiate on a go forward basis our incentive, uh, proper incentives. So, uh, Mark, let me throw it back to you. Yes, yeah, you'll see on this last frame um, question. Um, you know, we've reached the one hour point in our call today, and we hope it's been valuable. We hope it's suggested issues to consider. Um, our own sense is that when you have uncertain times like these, the best employers make the smart move, whether it's to encourage and retain people or to put in protections that make sure that they come out of this stronger and better in the long run. We welcome anyone who desires follow-up information to contact us by phone or email 
our information is um, in these PowerPoints that you've seen, and we can provide it separately, whether questions or further information. Dan and I have articles on most of the topics we've talked about. We'll be glad to share them. In all respects, we thank you for listening. We wish you well, and we hope you stay in touch. Thank you, everyone. Good day. Thank you. Bye.